Brother, it's good to be here at this feast, and I'm enjoying this feast, and I'm sure you are too, all of you. I can tell you're enjoying it, man. I love the fellowship, and I love to hear that noise of the fellowship that goes on. That's joy. <clears throat> but, brother, everybody doesn't believe that there's going to be, this is going to end one of these days, and then take over permanently. Then. So we're going to talk a little about this. Let me turn my speaker on here. Always lacking something. <clears throat> Not much room. Brother, we believe, we believe there's going to be a destruction of this planet. And by the way, if you want to title this sermon, if you want to give a title to it, it's Refurbishing a Planet. And we believe that this, this planet is going to need refurbishing, restoring and renewing one of these days because Jesus Christ is coming back especially to do that. And whether we believe it or not, or whether we want to believe it or not, we have been called to help do this very thing. That's part of our project. That's part of what God has got planned for us. See? You see, when you talk to people about this, you, you, you have to be careful because they just, they love this old society so well. They love this world, they love this nation, they love it all so well that it, it turns them off. They just don't, don't want to believe that. As a matter of fact, some of the, some of the, some of the, uh, some of the apostles didn't believe Jesus Christ. They had been taught by him for, what, three years or so. They didn't want to believe that either, what had to happen in order for this to be refurbished or replenished. They didn't want, they didn't, they, they didn't want to believe that either. You see, but our Savior gave his life for that, that this plan that God had laid before man was ever placed on this planet earth, God laid the plan, and we're just part of that plan, and so were the apostles. They were part of that plan, and the prophets, and all of us. See? But, you, but you see, the Savior gave his life for that, and some of the apostles didn't understand it. And let's go to Mark 8. Let's get a little information about this, how some of them felt after they had been taught by Christ for at least three years. He said in verse 31, he's talking to his disciples, they're talking to the apostles. And he said in verse 31, and he, Jesus Christ that is, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. They didn't want to hear that, but they were having a good time with him. He was performing miracles and doing all kinds of things for him. They didn't want to hear that. And after three days, rise again, he said. Then Jesus spoke this word openly. He was telling everybody around him that. And then Peter took him aside, off to the side, and he began to rebuke him. And he was saying, and I want to paraphrase this, you don't need to be telling things like that. That's going to turn people off. See? But that's not what, that's what, what Jesus was about, you see. But when he had returned around and he looked at his disciples, then Jesus rebuked Peter. What did he tell Peter? He said, look, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful. You don't understand the things of God, but the things of men. The things you've been inst has been instilled in your mind by Satan the devil. See? So that didn't set too well, I, I guess, with, with the people. And first, but because he wanted to follow the life that he had grown up in. He didn't want to listen. He wanted to hear Christ. He loved Christ to a certain degree. But he never really believed that he was supposed to die because of that. For all of mankind, it was hard for him to wrap his mind around, you see. Peter never really understood. He never really understood what Jesus Christ had taught him for those three years until the rooster crowed and it dawned on him. You know the story. You see, Peter never really understood it till then, and then he wept bitter for the way he felt. Turn to Genesis chapter 12.
Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord has said to Abram, now Abram was leaving the country. He didn't like what was going on there. Everybody was doing their own thing. Abram was a, was a Chaldean. He was a Gentile. Now the Lord said to Abram, he said, now get out of your country and get away from your family and get away from your father's house and to a land that I'm going to show you. I'll show you where to go. And I'll make you a great nation. And I'll bless you. And I'll make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you. And I'll curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, he was testing Abraham to see if Abraham would obey and do what he told him to do. You see, but Abraham was so obedient to God and believed in God so much that when he offered his son, they made a contract and made a covenant with Abraham. See, they made a covenant between the two. Each one would give their firstborn son. Each one would give their firstborn son. Now, never uh, Jesus, uh, God the Father, saw him offer his firstborn son. He took him to the point where he knew he was going to slay him and knew that he would slay him and caused the blood to flow from his own son. And he stopped him so he wouldn't have to suffer that. But he was going to suffer it. You see, Abraham never saw, never saw God sacrificed what he had promised. As a matter of fact, nobody did until about 2,000 years later plus. And it came to pass. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, Jesus was teaching these apostles that God had given him, and he had chosen them, and he was teaching them what, was, what they were going to do, that they were going to be in a kingdom, that the kingdom of God was coming to this earth. And he said in verse 15 of chapter 22, he said, Now, with fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover to you before I suffer, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until the fulfillment in, in, is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Now take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now that was their supper. Then he washed the feet. It's not recorded here, but it's recorded other places. We won't go there. And after he washed the feet then, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave them to him saying, this is my body. What he was really saying is, this is the completeness of the covenant that God made, my father made with Abraham. This is the new covenant. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Don't forget it. And then he took the cup. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and everyone. That was the fullness of the contract or the covenant that God had made with Abraham over 2,000 2, years before. See? That was when, when the Spirit was made available after Christ died the Spirit was made available then, and then that fulfillment of, of all the world, all the families of the earth then, could be blessed by Abraham's seed through Jesus Christ. Then something happened. It happened, you see. <clears throat> Excuse me. In verse 28, he's still teaching his apostles. He said, but you're the ones, you who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom. I'm going to give you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit in thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. 
And then he looked at Peter. He said, Peter, indeed Satan has asked for you, but I'm going to pray for you. He wants you to sift you like wheat. But I'm going to pray for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. Now we know the story that Peter gave a tremendous sermon on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. Christ had blown on them before, breathed on them, and had given them the Holy Spirit. And now Peter was being led by the Holy Spirit. He was being strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And he gave an awesome sermon on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, there was 3,000 added to those people who should be in the kingdom of God. Holy Spirit began to work. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to, uh, let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verse, and verse 17. Matthew recorded this. In verse 17 he said, Now, Jesus now had been resurrected. He had fulfilled what he was supposed to do. So he, and when they saw Jesus then, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and he spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. You go therefore, you go therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. So the Holy Spirit would come to them. Thank you. They had been given the Holy Spirit. They had been given the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the world. I'm going to be with you forever. There'll be no end to it. See? Now then, brethren, you see, Peter then began to expound to them. Now turn to Acts 3. Peter began to expound to them the same way he had been instructed by Jesus Christ, telling them the things that the Holy Spirit revealed to them. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Verse 19. Peter was telling these people that Christ had risen. And he said, You repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of our Lord. It won't be like it's been. It won't be a drag like it's been. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you beforehand, from heaven, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. What does that include? That included everything that Satan has goofed up on this planet Earth today. That included all of everything that Satan has goofed up on this planet Earth. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets. How long? How long ago? Before the world began. See, that plan was laid before man was ever put here because God planned his family. See? For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up the one like you, a prophet, among your brethren. Him you shall hear, and whatever he says to you, do it. See? Now let's go to, that's the restoring of all things. Now that's a whole lot of doing, you see. That's not like sitting on cloud nine floating around doing nothing. You see, there's going to be a lot to be done. You see, and these guys that don't want to work, you see, they're, they're going to be in the wrong place if they're not careful. Because we, we, want to, we want to work. A lot of work to be done, you see. Now then, Second Peter chapter 3, Peter continues to preach. Jesus prayed for him. You know, that he would return and teach the brethren. 
In Peter chapter 2, I'm sorry, Peter 3, verse 10. Peter said this, sent this word down to us. He said, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That's going to take a lot of restoring, a lot of refurbishing, a lot of replenishing. Take care of that. Therefore, he said, he didn't say, if these things happen, notice this, he didn't say, if these things happen. He said, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are we to be in holy conduct and holy godliness? See? Looking for, remember, Jesus Christ said, look, pray thy kingdom come. That's what we're supposed to be doing, is praying that this kingdom come, what we represent here today. See? Looking for and hastening the coming of the, of, the Lord, of the day of the Lord God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he said, according to the promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. See? Now, we know there's going to be a new Jerusalem later, but there's going to be a a refurbishing of this planet Earth to make ready for that new Jerusalem that comes down. Okay. Therefore, he said, brethren, therefore, he said, beloved, looking forward to these things, are we looking forward to it? We better be looking forward to it, brethren, because it's going to happen. Okay. Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found of him at peace without spot and without blameless. Just this close to Jesus Christ's way of life that we can live because that's why we go to Sabbath services. That's why we're taught. That's why we have Bible studies. That's why we're called to be separated from the rest of the world, you see. Because he wants us to be like Jesus Christ. To be as close to it as... Now, we'll never reach that perfection in this life, but we're going to strive for it until death. You see, now Abraham, listen to me, Abraham was a man that set his mind and will to do what God told him to do. You see, he, he gave and offered the most precious thing that he had and put it above his life, above everything, to give his sacrifice. And, Jesus, and God the Father did the same thing when he gave Jesus Christ that was the covenant. Because both of them gave the most precious thing to them. <clears throat> Turn to Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter Beginning of verse 1, this rebuilding and replenishing and restoring of planet Earth, here's what it's about. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying this, Thus says the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it, the Lord who is, the Lord is his name, he said, call to me and I will answer you and show me great and mighty things which you don't know. You see, nobody knows the mind of God because he has a plan. We can't understand God's mind. We understand a little bit through a glass darkly. But you see, God's mind is far superior to our minds. We, he doesn't think like we do. We don't think like he does. But we have to follow the example and the instructions he gave to us to enter into the kingdom of God. In verse 4 he said, For thus says the Lord, the Lord God concerning the houses and the cities and the houses and the kings of Judah, which have pulled down, have been pulled down 
to fortify these siege mounds of the sword. Now, these were big mounds of dirt that were built up of rock and dirt in order to keep the enemy out. They were to fortify the, 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 the cities. And they came to fight the Chaldeans, but only to fill their places with the dead bodies of men whom they slay in my anger, whom I will slay in my anger and in my fury, for all of those wickedness I have hidden my face from this city. Look, I will bring it health, I'll bring it healings, and I will heal them and heal to them the abundance of peace and truth. Now, that's something that we have very little of on this planet Earth today. is truth and peace. Do you get disgusted to seeing the lies you see on television? Do you want to just throw a rock through it almost sometimes? Because you can't get one to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And verse 7, he said, verse 7, he said, I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return, and we rebuild those places as it was at first. And I will, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all of their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Then he said, he said, it shall be in my, it'll, it'll be to my name a joy, it'll be to my name a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth. All of them. Who shall hear all the good that I do to them and shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and all the prosperity that I provide for it? He's going to reestablish it. They're going to have plenty. He's going to give them plenty. In verse 10 he says, this says the Lord, Again there shall be heard in this place of which you say is desolate, without man and without beast, and the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man and without inhabitants and without beast, the voice of joy and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who will sing, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endures forever. See, that'll be us doing that. See, that'll be the people of God who have come through, who have come through a lot of problems, a lot of trouble in order to be entered into the kingdom of God. But you see, God is going to try people. He's going to test them like he did Abraham to see if he'd be, see if he'd be faithful. Abraham was known the faith of the faithful. See? Now then, we're going to be tried. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 2. John in vision. He said, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Or to stop them. He said, Look, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God in their forehead. Have sealed them in their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all of the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, I don't believe these were just Israel, Israeli bloodlines. These were people from all nationalities who had been called into the church of God and were serving the church of God. This is the church of God, but 12,000 of each of those would be assigned to each of the tribes of Israel. The names would be on the doorposts, on, over the doors. Now those were sealed and protected, 144,000 of them. In verse 9 he said, after these things then, after the sealing took place, 
After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. Who were those people? People from all nationalities, from all nations were there. And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures who fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. They said, Bless, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be to our God forever and ever. In verse 13, he said, And then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. You know. And so he said to me, These are the ones, he answered his own question then. He said, So these are the ones to come out of the great tribulation, and washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. Now, who are those people? Those were the people who failed to come out of her when, John, when Jesus Christ had said, Come out of her, my people, and don't be a part of her, lest you partake of the plagues that's going to fall on her. See, they had to go through these tribulations. They had to, be, they had to suffer for it. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. But they repented through that tribulation. They repented through the punishments. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor heat, nor the heat bother them. For the Lamb who is in the midst of them in the throne will shepherd them. The great shepherd will lead them to a living fountain of waters, and the God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. All of the sickness, all that Satan has bestowed on us and caused those people to suffer. And those people repented. In the tribulation, they repented, and they came out of it. See? But you see, we're told to come out of that system and not be a part of it, so we won't have to go through that. See? <clears throat> I don't have enough room for all my notes here. You see, this, 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 these people, these people had accepted this covenant, this contract between God and Abraham. They had accepted Jesus Christ. They had accepted his sufferings and his, and his death. They had accepted the contract because when they went down and made a covenant at baptism, we'll get to that just, 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 a, just a little bit later. You see, they were working toward a royal dynasty. God was causing the people, and they were working toward a royal dynasty in this planet Earth, changing everything, changing everything from the least to the most. See? Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, beginning of verse 1. You see, here, here we find Jesus Christ was exercising his authority that God had given him. He said in verse 1, he said, There shall come forth a rod from the sim of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And his delight, his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by what he sees. He will not decide by the hearing of his ears what somebody tells him, you see. He won't make judgments like that. 
but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equity of the meek of the earth and shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with his breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Because righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness shall be the belt of his waist. You see, brethren, things are going to change. Everything, all answers will be there with Jesus Christ. And all answers will have been given at that time to all the apostles who is over those people. See, are those who have come into the kingdom. And verse 6, he said, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatlings shall lay down together. And the little child shall be led by them shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall graze, and the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child shall play with the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand to the viper's den, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountain, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You see, brethren, when we say we're going to refurbish everything, a restoration of everything, we do away with all that Satan has put into this system on this planet Earth. There'll be no hostility toward animals out here where one has to prey on the other see, for survival. There'll be no hostility toward men where men desire to be over other men and can't rest until they destroy everybody and become over everybody. That's going on tonight. Well, we see it every time you see the news. You see that. Men desiring to be over others. See, all that attitude is going to be changed. Everything is going to be changed. There won't be any such thing as that anymore. Let's turn to Hosea. Hosea chapter 2. Verse 6. Human nature will be changed. Animal nature will be changed. Everything will be changed. Because God will be ruler. God is God. We won't be deceived by people anymore. In Hosea 2 and chapter, in verse 18, the prophet said this. In that day I will make a covenant with them. Covenant with who? A covenant with the people that's there. A covenant with the animals. A covenant with everybody, everything. In that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beast of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the creeping things of the ground. And the bow and the sword of battle I will shatter from the earth to make it lie down safely. To make them lie down safely. Now what did he say? He's going to do away with all the weaponry of this world. He's going to do with all the guns. It won't be any more hunting, hunting deer, deer and elk and whatever, elk and whatever. He's going to do with all of this shooting and weaponry that exists. And it won't exist anymore. Because man will be at peace with animals. They'll love animals. And animals will be at peace with men. He's going to do with all the fire weapons and so on. If you like to bird hunt, you like I did, you, it's, you might as well forget it. Might as well forget it. I love bird hunting. Buddy, I love it. You see, brother, in 19, he said, I will betroth you to me forever. And I will betroth you to me in the righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. And I'll betroth you to me faithful in faithfulness. And you shall know and you shall know the Lord, that it, it shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, say, says the Lord, and I will answer the heavens, and I will answer from the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, plenty of agricultural uh, uh, stuff to eat, and I'll answer with new wine, and I'll answer with oil, and I'll answer Jezreel, which is... God will sow, it means, is what it means. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy, and I will say to those who were not a people at all, 
You are my people. Why would he say that? Why would they be God's people? Because they gave up everything they had. They gave up everything. They put God first above everything else to serve him. See? And they shall say, you are my God. See, brethren, wonderful, joyous thing that's going to bring peace to this planet Earth. Our minds can't wrap around that. Peace on earth, all we've ever known in our lives and we're getting older. All we've ever known is turmoil and war and stuff. See? That's going to cease, brother. That's going to cease. Turn to Psalms 8. Psalms chapter 8, beginning of verse 6. The psalmist wrote this. He said, Now you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all, put all things under his feet. It's Jesus Christ. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, even the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea, O oh Lord, our Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in the earth. You see, brother, we're going to be praising God. We're, we're, going, to, we're, we're, we're going to be singing praises to him. We want to be telling praises to him. We're going to be praising him personally in the kingdom of God. See, because we'll be sons of God. We will have been changed at that time. We'll be sons of God. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 22. You see, God is going to bring peace to every facet of life, whatever it is. Ezekiel chapter 22. Beginning of verse 25. If you want to see, if you want to take a look at this planet Earth we live in now, just listen as we go through this. Just listen. The conspiracy of her prophets are in the midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured the people and they have taken treasure and precious things that, they, that have made many widows in their midst. A lot of people have been killed. A lot of husbands have been killed. A lot of fathers have been killed. A lot of people have been killed. Her priests and her viol have violated my law and profaned my holy things, and they have not distinguished between holy and unholy. They can't tell. They don't know what holy is. They holler, God bless America, but they don't know anything about God. And you've got to ask yourself, why should he bless a, a deceived nation that knows nothing about God? See? They have nor have they known the differences between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. Brings to mind something. I'd like to comment just a minute on a personal experience here. I'll get back to this just in a minute. I hope I don't break your train of thought. You see, this thing of, you, you, you have privileges to worship the way you want to. You do. You can worship the way you want to. But you see, what I've been told, not just once, but several times in various different ways. They said, look, you, you worship all the way you want to, but you can't do that and work here. See? That's freedom. Freedom of worship. That's the kind of freedom of worship this country persists, per per persists to you. See? That's what he's talking about. That's all going to be changed, brethren, so that I am profaned among all of them. Now, her... Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. Ever hear of that? Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God when the Lord had not spoken. We hear that all the time. The Lord spoke to me last night, you know. 
The Lord didn't speak to him. Well, what is that's a divining lie, isn't it? Sure it is. Sure it is. And verse 29, it said, Now the Lord of the land had used oppression, the people of the land, rather, has used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor and needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on the half of the, on the half of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found nobody I could depend on. Nobody. Nobody was responsible. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath, and I have recompensed their deeds on their own head. He's going to destroy all such as that. It's going to be destroyed. And brethren, you and I, whether we like it or not, we're going to help destroy it. We're going to help destroy it. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 20. Apostle Paul wrote this. Paul was an educated man in the law and educated in in the spiritual part of it in Jesus Christ because he was taught personally by Jesus Christ. He said this, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will deliver from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. You see, it's not going to be this way all the way. It's going to be changed. God is going to change that with his people, all of those who take up the covenant of of Abraham's seed. See? For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Who's that? We are the first fruits. Jesus Christ was the first of the first fruits who died for us and was harvested and he's waiting for us. So we can be entered into that kingdom of God as the first fruits. We're going to put down this thing. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemptions of our body. If there ever was a true statement, that's it. Because we groan for it, brother. We're tired and sick and tired of this planet earth the way it is now. Kill it. Slaughter it. Innocent people. Take nothing of it. It's just a normal way of life for people. Sickness. Let's turn to... Turn to Galatians chapter 3. I can find it. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Verse 18 through 18. Galatians 3, verse 16 through 18. The Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he does not say, and the seeds, as of many, but he's talking about one, and to your seed who is Christ. Now this I say, that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul that covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Gave it to him. In verse 25, skip down to verse 25, it says, Now after faith has come, we have no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God. 
through faith in Jesus Christ, for as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to what God promised Abraham. All the families would be blessed in the earth. You're part of it. Mm -hmm. Now I ask you, brother, what is the seed of Abraham? The seed of Abraham is one who makes a commitment that nothing on this planet Earth will stop him from going on into the kingdom of God, from serving God and serving Jesus Christ, that nothing will come ahead of Christ. Christ will be first. That's the way we get into the kingdom. That's how we become kings and priests in the kingdom of God. It's sticking to that commitment we made. Turn to Luke 14. Luke 14, in verse 26, you had this read to you when you made the covenant. When you joined that covenant, you had this read to you. It said, now if anyone, this is Jesus says this, if anyone comes to me and does not love less his father and his mother, his wife and children and brothers and sisters, Yes, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. You see, Abraham took the most precious thing he had and tried to slay it because God said so in obedience to God. But God stopped him. Stopped him at that point. But Jesus, but God the Father didn't stop. Jesus, God the Father gave Jesus Christ as his part of that promise. And we have to make that same commitment that we're going to put nothing ahead of Jesus Christ. See? First and foremost, above everything else, and if you have anything else there, brethren, you are committing adultery. And not adultery, but idolatry. See? It's wrong. You've got something else ahead of God. You've got to repent of it. You've got to keep God and Jesus Christ first. See? That's the, seed of, that's, that's the seed of Abraham. In Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, let's begin in, verse, in, in, in Romans 10 and verse 20. For Isaac is bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. These were the Gentiles. And I was made manifest to those who do not ask for me, but to Israel I say, all day long I stretch forth my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. They didn't want to obey. They wouldn't obey. Therefore he rejected them. But that's temporary. He's not going to save them all. He's not going to lose them all. They're going to be saved, but not now. And verse 11 in chapter 1, he said, in verse 1, he said, I say then, has God cast away his people? And he answered his own question. He said, certainly not. For I'm an Israelite myself, but I'm of the seed of Abraham. See? I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Benjaminite, but I'm of the seed of Abraham. I have no intentions of ever turning back, ever turning my head that to go forward till I enter into that kingdom. See? <clears throat> he went thrusted into that. Turn the, turn the page to chapter 12. He meant for us to do that. Chapter 12 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, I beseech you, brother. I beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice that's wholly acceptable to God because it's a reasonable thing to do. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, developing the mind of Christ, developing the mind of Christ, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. What does he expect of us? He expects us to keep striving for that perfection. Every one of us, imitating Jesus Christ, taking on all the knowledge that we can of Jesus Christ and exercising it in our life. Stare clear. And stare clear. Stare clear of the world that Satan has deceived and controls through two or three different ways of controlling. Second Peter 2, we're going to close with this. Second Peter, I'm sorry, First Peter. First Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm sorry, I get it, get it, I get it right in a minute. 1 Peter 2 and verse 1. He said this. Therefore, laying aside all malice and deceit, you've got to be honest and not deceitful. You've got to be as close to perfection as you possibly can, as Peter is saying. Laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy and envy and all speaking and all uh, evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the, word, milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted the Lord is gracious. If you understand that, if you've had a little experience of it, you do those things. Coming to him as a living stone. He was the rock. He's the foundation of the church rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And you also, he said, who? You and me and all the church of God to have God's Holy Spirit. And you also as living stones, little stones that's growing, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What we do, brethren, how we act. How we act, brethren, is what it's all about. We try to be like Jesus Christ. We want to be just like Him. We want to be stones too, little stones. We want to be living stones like Jesus Christ was. You see, brethren, building up a royal dynasty, making ready for a royal dynasty to take over this planet Earth and to refurbish it, brethren, under the, under, under the administration of Jesus Christ, but entered into the household of God as his children. It takes work. See? It don't come automatic. It takes work and concentration because we're going to change everything on this planet Earth. And first of all, we've got to change ourselves see? in order to get into the kingdom of God. We've got to become little stones. We've accepted that contract with Jesus Christ, with God and Abraham. We've accepted that contract. We are the seed of Abraham. Mm-hmm. And the big box being built up in the kingdom of God, for the kingdom of God. 